Marshall and Sagar here. Welcome back to The Realignment. This week, we sat down with Michael Duran, one of the right's foremost Middle East security experts and senior fellow at Hudson Institute. Mike has taught at Princeton, New York University, and the University of Central Florida. He served President George W. Bush as a senior director in the National Security Council and also held roles in the administration's defense and state departments. Mike's experience after the Bush administration, along with the election of Donald Trump, led him to examine how the populist dissatisfaction at home was impacting U.S. foreign policy abroad. Mike advocates for what he describes as a third-way foreign policy that navigates between the isolationist and interventionist tendencies of the left and right. Let's dive in. Michael Duran, welcome to Realignment. Great to be here. Thank you. Mike, the reason that we wanted to have you on was there's a lot of interesting discussions here that we focus on. The changing discussion around policy areas like economics and trade, but a lot of these are more in the domestic sphere. There hasn't been as much of a grappling with how foreign policy is changing in a realignment world. And so you have been, you've worked in the academic space, you worked in the DOD, now you work here at the Hudson Institute. How have you seen the conservative foreign policy consensus change over time since you began in, the, uh, in your work? Well, I, uh, I came to Washington in 2005 to work for the Bush administration, and I came on the coattails of the neocons. I wrote some stuff. I was I was teaching at Princeton, and I, I wrote some things about the Middle East. That's my area of expertise, and uh, uh, it got the attention of uh, the neoconservatives. And I went to work in the White House for uh, Elliot Abrams, um, and uh, I think the biggest thing that when I look at it from my, my point of view, uh, the biggest thing I see is the um, is the. Uh, undermining of the neocon point of view. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know how long that will last. And what is the neocon point of view? Well, the neo, neocon point of view is basically values in foreign policy. Mm-hmm. And uh, us, using force to enforce those values? Right. Yeah. I, I would put it as kind of the neocons are, and I wouldn't have said this until yeah. after Trump, by the way, so uh-huh. we, we should come back to that. But I would, I would describe them now as the kind of conservative arm, uh, the militant arm of Wilsonianism. Mm-hmm. Referring uh, to Woodrow Wilson, yeah, um, trying to remake the world in America's image after World War One. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, spreading democracy and you and willing. And you used to teach at the Wilson School. So, yeah. I didn't actually, yeah. oh, okay. but I, yeah, I was. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I spoke there often. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. So uh, yeah, they're using uh, using American power to spread to spread democracy and uh, and, and values, and that, and that was central to the uh, to the vision of President Bush in the Middle East was mm-hmm. the democratization of the Middle East. And so how, what, when you were in the White House, obviously 2005 kind of was the height of that neocon era, and then you saw much of the American public fall out of dissatisfaction with that in a very rapid, short period of time. What was that like while you were working within the administration, and what was the grappling like within the foreign policy elite at that time? Uh, I'm not sure that the foreign yeah. policy elite grappled with it as much as we, we probably should have. Um, I'll tell you what I got. I came in just as I came into the administration. There was a hur- Hurricane Katrina, and and I felt I hadn't been in the in the in the White House before that, but I felt something between the president and the public break at Katrina, which was very interesting. I mean, people just stopped listening. Uh, to a lot of what President Bush was saying. I mean, he couldn't move the needle with a speech anymore uh, uh, after that. That was very apparent to me. Mm. And you saw it, you know, uh, in, in, as, as the war in, in Iraq um, got more and more difficult, you, you saw one of the things that he did was uh, he put uh, uh, Crocker and Petraeus forward. Like they, he, they built up, they consciously built up General Petraeus um, to be the voice of the administration on 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 Iraq because they needed one the, because they needed the they needed yeah. a credible voice yeah. because I, I think the president's voice itself wasn't was no longer moving the needle. So at the time, did you think that did you buy into the neoconservative foreign policy consensus? Uh, yes, would yes, I, yes. I, your, so actually, then would you have described yourself as a neoconservative? Yeah, what, no, yeah, what was I your, didn't. What I was didn't. your mindset going into the administration? Well, well see, yeah. I, for, from my point of view, yeah. uh, this whole thing has been an, an, an education. 
I, uh, I had not thought all these things through. I wasn't, uh, I, I didn't have a clear worldview, I would say. I mean, I had inclinations, and I knew I, I, I like this, I don't like that, but I hadn't thought it all through in any kind of systematic way. And I, I didn't, uh, when people would call me a neocon, I used to joke and say, I'm not a neocon, I'm, I'm a running dog of the neocons. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I uh, and that's how, that's how I saw myself. I never, I never totally bought into the democratizing the Middle East thing. What I, but what I noted, I'm, uh, uh, I am a, a big supporter of Israel. Um, uh, on an emotional and an intellectual level, and I always have been. And uh, in 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 the foreign policy world, it, it it's it's changing now, but it used to be very clear that the supporters of Israel were the neocons, and the realists, you know, the the conservative critics of of the of the neocons were were hostile to uh, to Israel. People so, from the George H. W. Bush administration, mostly. Oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so Brent Scowcroft and right. uh, from the HW and and uh, and uh, James Baker, the the Secretary of State, and then in the in the uh, um, uh, you know in the academic area, Walton Mearsheimer and, mm-hmm. and and people like Walt. You know, uh, so I, I I have a lot of kind of realist inclinations, um, but uh, but the, there's in my in my view the realists on the Middle East, the, the people who are anti-Israel. They're actually ideologues. Uh, they are ideologically opposed to Israel. It makes no sense in, in terms of their in terms of their theory of foreign policy. They should be they should love Israel, but, Why is they, that? but they don't because because realism is about power, and it's about it, it, look Israel. Israel helps stabilize the Eastern Mediterranean for the United States at at, at very little cost. That's and and it, it, Israel is willing to go out and fight. Uh, uh, for its own interests, without the United States having to send its own uh, uh, it, its own military. So if you're into if you're into say well, like what what Stephen Walt claims he's into, which is offshore balancing, then this is a fantastic act. Yeah. And what's offshore balancing? Well, where 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 the United States uh, the, the United States is sort of the the last uh, uh, the balancer of last resort, where we. We, we, we try to create a balance of power within these different areas of the world um, and without having to use our own forces. And what makes this so fundamentally different than an ideological support for Israel? Oh, well, they, they, but see, look, they also, they also believe um, that I'm talking about the realists of yes. your. They, they also say that the neoconservative emphasis on values is totally misplaced. Right. So so, the, the, you know, when when they see uh, w- when they see uh, hundreds of thousands uh, of people being slaughtered in Syria, millions of people being uprooted, it's, it, it, ho-hum. OK, it's not our job to go to, to, to go get in, to go get involved. But suddenly when it comes to Israel, they have this unbelievable moral rhetoric uh, w- or or this argument with the, their argument used to be that uh, the U.S. association with Israel is is driving away all of the Arabs. But now people have seen over the last decade, it's especially, it's yeah. totally untrue. Right. It's, all, look, it's always been untrue in my, yeah. in, in my view. But it's been repudiated from a, on the ground. Like you can't, the, yeah, you it, can't watch what's going on right now in the Middle East as the, uh, you know, as the Saudis and the and Emiratis get closer to Israel all the time that the U.S. Is, you know, has, has backed them. So, so the thing is, yeah. we've sort of taken this to basically the end of the Bush administration. I like your reference to this whole experience being an education for you. What is the product of that education? How have you changed since then? Uh, I became much more wary about the use of force um, uh, and much more wary about what we can do. I I thought, I had an argument with a friend of mine, he's somebody whose name you would know. I'll I'll keep him out of it. But um, I remember when when the Iraq war began, he came to me and he said, they're, they're really screwing all of this up. Um, and, and I said, look, they're, they're going to get it right in the end because, because the, the stakes are too, are, you know, the, the stakes are too great. Um, and I, I don't think we ever got Iraq right. And, uh, and I no longer believe that things will sort of just write themselves on these, in, in, in these matters. I wrote a book on, uh, on Eisenhower. I thought it was very interesting that when Eisenhower was sending the troops into Lebanon in 1958, this is the most successful foreign intervention the United States has ever done. I mean, it was, uh, uh, um, I think, two soldiers died, um, one in an accident. Uh, 
<clears throat> but he didn't know that that was going to be the case when he, when he sent them. And in his memoirs, he said that sending the troops into Lebanon was the second most difficult decision he had to make. You know, the first one being D-Day. Because everything could go wrong. Yeah. But anyway, I, uh, a, um, uh, I, I read an account from an aide who came upon him when he was struggling with the decision. And he was struggling over the justification for the intervention which I thought was very interesting. Now, this is a guy with enormous experience in military intervention. And he understood that how this thing is defined and shaped, how it's presented to the American public at was going to have an enormous, at its conception, it's going to have enormous influence over the whole, um, uh, over the whole course of it. So, um, you know, I, 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 think, I don't take these things as lightly as I did, as I might have in the past when I didn't see how it could all go wrong. Um, I, 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 I have, I also, you know, I watched the, the, the debate and I watched how quickly the support, particularly in the left, uh, for the uh, for intervention evaporated. I mean, the, the Democrats have rewritten the history now, but they were there supporting it um, at, at the time. But it evaporated. By 2004, it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. And, uh, and, and so um, uh, just I, I guess what I – part of my lesson, part of this lesson was not so much about the world but about us and, and, and who we are. Um, but also, I, this, the, the election of Donald Trump was a turning point for me because that's when I realized that these ideas that uh, had been dominant in our foreign policy uh, didn't have a lot of legitimacy in, uh, in, in, in the, among the American public, on the right and on the left. So we talked about values defining foreign policies. What are the other ideas that deny legitimacy? Well, I, I, I wouldn't talk about it so much in terms of ideas, mm -hmm. except that as, as just that there has grown a great disconnect between the, the ideas in the foreign policy elite and the, and the public. The public doesn't see that the, that the American foreign policy, the traditional foreign policies, are serving the interests of the, the middle class. Um, that seems to me to be obvious. That was Do Donald Trump had an incredibly uh, uh, Donald Trump had an incredibly consistent message in the in the campaign in 2016, and that is that y your elites are looking after themselves and not after you, and that's true across the board in foreign policy and domestic policy and so forth. Um, and, and I I don't think that there's been a, a sufficient reckoning among foreign policy experts on the right with with this fact because. Still in this town, you can feel it. Everybody thinks after Trump, the man, leaves the scene, we're going back to where we were well, in 2012. You said something. You said we, you learned about who we are. What, what did you mean by that? Who, who are we as America, and what, what was that lesson? Well, I mean, that, that's just sort of my own idiosyncrasy because I, I, uh, I spent my early adulthood – uh, working in Middle Eastern studies at universities, um, and and by the way, I thought I was left wing. I, I I thought I was surrounded by this, you know. And Middle Eastern studies at universities is like a cult. I wouldn't like to call it left wing, is to give it too much, sort of mainstream credit, right? It's it's a cult. <laughs> uh, 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 I, a cult is probably the wrong word too, but it's a bizarre. It's a, it needs to have a a, a humorous British academic yeah. novel written about it, right? It's yeah. just a, a little strange subset of, uh, <laughs> of, of 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 humanity. No, the the way the stuff they talk about, the, the things they believe, it has nothing to do with reality. If you know something about the Middle East, if you've been to the Middle East, you read about it in the newspaper, and then you listen to what they how they talk about it at 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 panels at the Middle Eastern Studies Association, you, you think this is a virtual Middle East that these people made up, right? So um, I, I say that with no, this yeah. is, no, this is a, a, a description of reality, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, so I thought I was left wing because I thought, okay, I'm surrounded by all these crazy people who believe these crazy things. Some of them very intelligent, have insight into this or that aspect of the world, but in terms of their political views, they're out of their minds. Uh, but out there in the real world, beyond academia, there's there's a You're more a mainstream uh, Democrat. Yeah, I'm a mainstream Democrat. But then I, lo, lo and behold, I, when I got sucked into the, it's only after 9/11 that I got sucked into the mainstream discussion. And then I found out, oh, actually, I'm not a mainstream Democrat hmm. at all. And so after you found I, you find out you're not a mainstream Democrat, and now you go through this Bush administration. Now, I mean, let's go to the Obama administration. So you're sitting here. 
you're in Washington, D.C., post out of the White House. What is the reaction and your continued education to the Obama presidency and your main takeaway? Well, the, the Obama presidency shocked me. I, I, I regard myself as, as an unbelievable, unbelievably good analyst of Barack Obama. I believe that, uh, that I know every thought that goes through Barack Obama's mind. Uh, and, and, and I believe I'm a, great, I'm a great help to conservatives, especially crazy conservatives who think, you know, he's a closet Muslim or he's a, you know, he's a, uh, uh, he's a closet communist, mm. all these kind of crazy does, ideas. Your point, is, what you're getting at, too, is it doesn't require conspiracy yeah. to, uh, to understand no, it, why he believes right. in these. No, so tell us. What, it requ- what, yeah. Why am I? Yeah. Why, or, what well, what did he so, believe? What, makes, what, what is well, it? Let about? me hear you say. What yeah. makes you so good, Mike? Yeah. What is it? What what makes you so good about that? Uh, well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> uh, I, no, it's because I am uh, pretty much his age. Mm-hmm. We went to the same kinds of schools, came from the same kind of background. I mean, this whole thing, dreams of my father. His father was never around. He grew up in a middle-class white home um, in Hawaii. And then he went to I, – I didn't grow up Kansas, in Hawaii. Yeah. But uh, – uh, and then he went to the ca- same kinds of schools. And so, and I, you know, I spent a good chunk of my ad- early adulthood in the Ivy League, right? And so I know how Ivy League professors think about the world. And that, that's yeah. how Barack Obama thinks about mm-hmm. the world. Now, what distinguishes him from Ivy League professors is he's an outstanding retail politician. Mm-hmm. And so he can take that Ivy League world view, which is a utopian world view, uh, it's a, a worldview highly critical of American power and utopian at the same time. And he can translate it into a concrete political agenda. What's utopian about it? Uh, because it, 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 it's a one-worldism. It's a, um, it, it's, it's a, uh, a, a, a transnational progressivism, which believes that, that, we are con- that the w- countries of the world are converging uh, becoming more alike, and that unity, you know, uh, comedy among the nations and unity is possible. And, go- and a good in of itself. So a good in and of itself and also possible. And American power should be, should be used in order to bring about that conversion. On a policy level, let's tease that out. What did that look like under the Obama? The Iran, the Iran deal. Okay. The Iran, uh, what it looks like, it means, it means belief in the notion, it, it, belief in the notion that um, greater... Uh, interdependencies among countries is going to lead to greater convergence and understanding. Uh, greater prosperity is going to re- is going to lead to greater democratization and understanding, and that that leads to the belief that um, that 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 th- this is. By the way, this is not this is not this is not simply a left. This is an American point of view. Yeah, and and, and to play devil's advocate on this too, right? If you look at the history of the post World War II era, right, the story that you could tell is we have the European Union, we have NAFTA, we have institutions such as the United Nations. This is sort of and our and our and our and our China yeah. policy. Yeah. Right. Our China policy for decades was was built on this idea. Yes. Right. Yeah, and so that's why uh, that's why China builds everything in Guangzhou that we buy in Walmart, and we, you know, we they they send our, those the they send those cheap goods to us, and we g- we give them our debt, and uh, and and this is going to create a kind of convergence. And so the same idea that it was basically that same idea is what prompted them to mm-hmm. to. Uh, and this uh, wasn't necessarily something that was shared. I mean, that was only on the left. I mean, this was pr- largely predominant on the right too. Oh, the, this was yeah. a, what absolutely. Right, yeah. What does right wing utopianism look like? Well, no, I, this is the, this is what the Trump this is what Trump opened up, and it shocked me to find out that a lot of the a lot of people that were conservative foreign policy experts were actually in agreement with an enormous amount of transnational progressivism. The disagreements were about use of military force and things like that, but the basic worldview was the same, and that that's that was uh, that was a real eye opener to me. Do you th- what? In fairness to right the sort of mainstream interpretation of the post World War II era, what did they get right? Right. So if we look at that story of convergence, right? Because once again, there haven't been great power wars since World War II, outside a few isolated incidents. What? about that story is correct. Look, I, I think there's a uh, I, I think there is value in spreading American um, d- uh, spreading democracy and American values. Uh, 
uh, and you, you can see the, uh, the story in the story in Japan, the story in uh, the story in South Korea, the story in Europe. These are all mm-hmm. very positive stories, um, and there uh, and there's a lot of truth to them. Uh, I think, though, that it became a kind of after Reagan, a kind of um, canned ideology. Um, the uh, a lot of the a, a, a kind of dogma mm-hmm. uh, and almost a kind of libertarian dogma about uh, about free in, about uh, free markets um, a, and uh, lack of a discussion of the American interest in all of this. It became a dogma disconnected from the notion of what's good for the American public, um, and that that's a that is the that's the first problem with it. The second problem with it is when it, w- it doesn't actually work in certain areas. It's not working in China. The extent of the failure in China we we have yet to figure out, but it, it's not working. We can see uh, we can see that China is competing with us, and China is using the is using our openness against us. It's not. It didn't work in the Middle East. It's not going to work in the Middle East. There's no do, you, do you think it's just about the collision of that framework with illiberalism? That it was like really the first kind of contact that it had with authoritarianism in China, and then and then with illiberalism in the Middle East. Is that what ultimately led to the questioning? No, I think yeah. it's. I think it's more than that. It's certainly yeah. that. But but I think it's more than that. It's not working in Europe anymore. Uh, the uh, I mean the the European pro- I, I think the, the the European project the EU project the the, the idea of an you know of, a, of an ever closer union it's over the, the union is not going to get closer uh, uh, and uh, you can see there's a huge backlash um, and and to a certain extent the Europeans are competitors with us now to a certain extent I'm some, uh, we 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 I, I think they are I think the Europeans are our allies. They have to work to uh, to build the alliance, but the alliance—I mean—to to maintain the alliance. But the alliance that was built uh, to to win World War II and then to win the cold the Cold War is no longer uh, is is no longer configured to meet the challenges of the moment. And and that's what Trump is so good at doing is, and that's what his election shows us is he show go- he's so good at at. Uh, at raising these questions, I'm not sure he has the right answer in every in, in in every regard. But he's raised these questions that the rest of us should come in and start working on. So really, ser- very difficult political and and um, uh, intellectual questions that we should be working on. You you referenced this earlier. You said that there's so many people who are just waiting for Trump to leave so that they can return to the old consensus. Do you think that would actually be? possible in any sort of new administration, given how much the Overton window on these issues has shifted in the foreign policy elite? Or would it truly be a reversion to kind of a 2012 consensus on how the world works? We're not going back. I, and that, I, I think that's getting increasingly clear. I would, I'm not really sure because I've stopped arguing with the people who, 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 who believe that we, we were going back. Well, uh, let's talk about what going back looks yeah. like, right? So it seems to me... It's easy to imagine a Democratic or Republican administration putting something together like the Trans-Pacific Partnership all over again. So we could go back in that way. I think it's easy to see a Democratic or Republican administration re-engaging with the expansion of NATO. I just, I think it's possible to argue that we're never going to intervene in countries the way we did um, during the Bush administration. This is also why the Obama administration handled Syria the way it did. What ways, though, can't we? What other ways can we not revert? I guess that's what I'm confused about. No, I, I think that the uh, I think that the kind of default interventionism that we had is gone. Okay, and you can look, you can see that there's this point on the spectrum where where uh, where Donald Trump, Rand Paul, and Bernie Sanders all kind of converge, or their or or their um, their aligned. constituencies yeah. uh, aligned, or there's. Let's just say there is a there is a constituency that each one of them has within their uh, uh, among their voters uh, um, who is who is saying what the hell are we doing in these places why why are why are my tax dollars going for this how is this serving the interest of the American middle class and so this is a very powerful feeling that has that has really uh, is penetrated a lot of the country now a lot of politicians have seized upon this to embrace a purely 
a total non-interventionist ideology, something that really revert like that goes against American intervention or action abroad. What do they get wrong about that? Why is that not the right approach? Uh, that uh, I would uh, you didn't name anyone, but I, I would say that that's sort of where Tucker Carlson sometimes ends up. Uh, Rand Paul for sure. Um, but uh, on, on the things that I follow most closely, the, the Middle East, I see Tucker Carlson sliding into that, um, uh, into that position with, and with respect to Iran. I, uh, the, the assumption in the, in the libertarian world, and, uh, and Tucker Carlson seems uh, some of his commentary, is that we are causing the conflict with Iran our belligerents, um, our support for Israel, uh, the neocons, right? They're the ones who are doing it. And if we'll just have a lighter touch, this is what Obama said in his, uh, in his first inaugural. You know, he'll, he, he's going he's gonna to reach out to Iran, and if Iran reaches back, then we, can, then we can cut a deal. There's a kind of feeling out there among the, 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 uh, the foreign policy elite. It's always been there that Iran and the United States are natural allies, and that it's American policy, um, among a segment of the, of, of, the, uh, of the foreign policy elite, that, um, that Iran and the United States are natural allies, and if we're failing to realize the potential of that uh, natural alliance, it's due to a failure of American policy. And this is just totally wrong, objectively wrong, in, in, in my view. Iran has um, inveterately hostile attitudes toward the United, the order that the United States represents in the, in, in the Middle East and toward the United States. Um, and it has hegemonic aspirations in, 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 the, in the Middle East. So you're getting to where the tension lies, especially on the sort of new right, the populist nationalist right. Some would argue the U.S. shouldn't even be concerned with the order in the Middle East, right? Because you're saying they're challenging the order in the Middle East. Like, if you're a populist nationalist, who cares? Well, Shouldn't we be focused on China? You yourself are bringing up China. I think China is the number one. Uh, I, I think China is the number one threat, and I think we need to understand the potential of um, a Chinese-Iranian alliance. And an American would. What's, what happens if America withdraws from the Middle East? Iran takes over all the oil of the Persian Gulf. That's what happens. Um, in alignment with with, with Russia in an alignment with China or in an alignment with both. Imagine a world in which um, it, it's not hard at all when you look at what's going on in the world today. Russia, China, Iran dominate Eurasia, the Eurasian landmass, threaten Europe, and then, and then control all of the oil coming out of the, uh, coming out of the Persian Gulf. And I that means they control Europe's oil. Then Europe becomes already a, natural gas. Yeah, Russia already right. controls Europe's natural gas too. Well, and I think Mike, what what scares these people, what they would say is, well, Mike, you know, every time I hear about hegemonic aspirations in the Middle East, then I know that the next step is a ground invasion of Tehran. So what's the answer? What what no, is that's, the, that's that's, that's yeah. silly. That's yeah. silly, and that's the, if the, the that's the that's the false choice that the Obama administration put before the American people with regard to the nuclear deal. It was, you know, they presented it as the the nuclear deal that I negotiated, or President Obama said the nuclear deal that I negotiated, or war, and and that nuclear deal was a was a complex of policies, not just about the nuclear program. It also meant turning a blind eye to Iranian interventionism in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, and elsewhere. And we're seeing before our eyes these days the results of all, the, the results of all that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's a false choice. The false choice, it's between, it's between the, the choice is between, uh, is between appeasement of Iran that we saw in the Obama administration and a policy of containing Iran and we can put together a policy of containing Iran and deterring it with a combination of American military power and allies on the ground. We have to build up allies on the ground. That's think, the key. I think the key to the way you're articulating this case then is that you're not saying, well, Iran is a non-liberal regime. You're not talking about they don't share American values. The way you're framing this entire course of policy action is in, America, is a, in a sort of America-centric term sheet. How do you do, how does the way you're describing the Iranian problem contrast with the way it would have been described during the Bush administration, though? Because what we're trying to get out in this episode, right, is how the right's language on the foreign policy. Well, I changing. well, so so I think I think that since the fall of the Cold War, the United States got stupid about strategy, and it, especially after 9/11, and we stopped talking about. If you want to understand the Middle East, about international relations, international politics, in the Middle East. 
the beginning, the middle, and the end of the discussion is about states. And it's about, it's about the power of states. And, and you, you talk about non-state actors like Al-Qaeda and ISIS uh, and, and, and the Palestinian uh, and you know, Hamas, Hezbollah, and so on, the Iranian proxies, in the context of the struggle between states. That's, and we stopped doing that. We stopped doing it on the right and we stopped doing it on the left. And we, we, we became stupid about strategy and, and into the vacuum moved. The, we built up this incredible... Uh, and this incredible transnational counter- framework. Well, transnational framework, but also a, a, a counterterrorism uh, bureaucracy uh, for fighting Al Qaeda and fighting ISIS, which which is a which wins the debate when you, when people don't have a clear vision of what they're doing. When I saw it in the White House time and time again, when you're sitting in a room and people are confused about the Middle East, the 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 counterterrorism guys are never confused. They want to go whack terrorists. And they're always there to say, I want to whack terrorists, and it's a domestic American imperative because we can't have another 9-11. Now, these are all valid arguments, but you're not going to have a successful counterterrorism strategy if you can't build a stable order. Building a stable order requires states. So the, we have to, the counterterrorism has to be understood within states, not as a thing in and of itself. So, Mike, you recently spoke at the National Conservatism Conference to talk about foreign policy and, and a way forward. This and that is, conference was about sort of trying to f- sort of take all these sort of post-2016 conservative forces, whether it's Tucker Carlson or John Bolton or J.D. Vance who we had on this program, trying to sort of work out a new framework for the right. Yeah. So where in that, where, how in, are you navigating that in particular, which is at this conference, there was John Bolton, there was Tucker Carlson, and there was J.D. Vance. What is the thread that is, that sh- that is there between John Bolton and between Tucker Carlson? Or is there any thread whatsoever? There is a thread. There, yeah. There's a and fascinating thing. Just yeah. before you go, we should add J.D. Vance on the show couldn't articulate what and that was. And we taped was. the show at oh, that no, there's a there, No, yeah. there's definitely a thread between John Bolton and, and Tucker Carlson. There's mm-hmm. also a disagreement. Mm-hmm. Around about 2000, John Bolton wrote an article in the, I think it was the Chicago Law Review, um, where he talks about uh, about globalism and a globalist foreign policy, and he, criti- he, he critiques the American foreign policy elite for being globalist, um, and, and he he depicts the the struggle as between nationalist and globalist. Uh, so uh, John Bolton was Trumpian before before Trump was Trumpian, far ahead of his time. He was yeah. way ahead of his time. Um, and John, John Bolton, if you ask him, w- when, when I worked with him in the White House, what he, if you ask him, are you a neocon, he would say, no, I am a con. The thing, the thing about jo- John Bolton is a conservative, um, a kind of real, a, a realist in foreign policy the way realism should be if it actually existed as a, as a, you know, as a school. Um, he's pro-Israel. That, uh, but he's not about spreading democracy at, at all. Now, he... He has a he has a willingness to use military force um, that uh, that makes people think he's a neocon, and that's where that's the point where he dis, where where that's the point where he and Tucker Carlson Tucker Carlson would be kind of militantly anti-interventionist these days, but in terms of their basic the the basic ideas they're working with they're they're identical. It's just their kind of uh, uh, receptivity so, to to interventionism. And, and I need to ask you this because. The terms that we use in these debates are incredibly charged, right? It's interesting that he was referring to globalism in the 2000s, right, before a lot of the sort of dynamics around it came about. How do you – do you use the word globalist when you're discussing foreign policy terms? Yeah, sure. I do because I think it's a real thing. So it's a so, – I mean there's yeah. – And, and I what, make a, what is it? What is globalism? Well, there's, yeah. a, there's, 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 there's globalization and there's globalism. Globalization, I, I think it's useful to make the distinction. Globalization is the condition of our world. Uh, phenomenon. That, that it's yeah. a phenomenon yeah. that we that none of it, that we are powerless to change right. things. You know, technology, so, technology, sub, supply chains on for automobiles uh, are uh, you, you know run From through ninety different countries. Ninety yeah, sure. different countries. Uh, the U.S. military is engaged all around the globe. You, with this podcast, we can do do a, a press of a button and it's going to go out to everyone simultaneously. The world right? is flat. The world yeah. is flat. Okay, that's that's globalization, but globalism is the ideology that says that this is a good thing. It is it is a good thing 
It, it cannot be moderated in any way. We should all adapt to it, and we should, and we should work to promote it. Uh, and and the people who and and we and we and the people who stand up and say, hey, what about what about the people who are left behind by globalization? They just don't count. So hmm. there's a lot to unpack there, because I really love the way you framed that. Who's been left behind? Well, the 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 the, um, uh, the entire um, working class, the the industrial working class all across the heartland, all across the Western world, with the exception of Germany, really. Uh, the, and the even then, they're seeing some problems. They, right? they must yeah. be. I mean, sooner yeah. or later, it's going to come to them, to, to, to them as well. But I mean, if you, if, if you grew up in, an, in a steel town in Ohio, or any factory in Pennsylvania, or even not just steel, um, and, uh, and, uh, and the factory goes under, and all the jobs go to China, and, and, and our, our uh, elite says to you, ah, sorry, you're just, you know, you're just, you're just the, um, you're just the losers in natural selection, the ec- economic natural selection. So devil's advocate, because we've had multiple guests on the other side of this globalization question, whether it's Megan McArdle and uh, George Will, what they will say is globalization is the result of markets. Markets are making things more efficient. They're creating things more, uh, a lot more prosperity. If you look at our lives a hundred years ago, as George Will said, it's a lot better than it was then. And if we look to our future, Megan McArdle has said on the show that it will be more prosperous for our grandchildren. What is your response to their defense of the globalization process? Well, I, I, I think, look, let me, let me just, let me, not def, I, I, let me not attack it morally, although I think it's morally, uh, that, that's a, that, that is a morally obtuse point of view. But forget about that. It's, it's a politically obtuse point of view. Because those those people are not going to go away, and they, those people are those, those people feel that their communities are being destroyed. They feel that nobody's listening to them about that. There's going to be someone who's going to come along and say, "I'm listening to you," and that's what Donald Trump is saying. It's what Bernie Sanders is saying. So you got it on the right, and you've got it on the left. It's it is now a part of our politics. They're fighting over those voters. The it's left a fundamental right. distinction in the in the value of what prosperity is, which is whether you know it's the prices of your consumption goods or whether it's the value of something. And Matt Stoller, who's on this podcast, talked about this. It's a producerist versus a consumerist framework. So it's interesting to to you are one of the people who will say and incorporate. Your do- the, the domestic political situation into your foreign policy. Now, is that something that we need to see more of if the right is going to move forward in this realignment? Absolutely. World? Yeah. I mean, I mean, it doesn't. It, it, the, the, the two are domestic politics and foreign policy are different. But if you if you fashion these ideas about what the United States should be doing in the world, and you and you have no concept whatsoever about whether you can sell them to the American people. That's ridiculous. Now you have to. The, we have to be aware of this. Now, um, the question is: This is why we get back to that question of whether Trump is a flash in the pan or not. Because I think a lot of my colleagues here in Washington think that that, that you know we're one terrorist attack away from the American public saying go intervene and everything. And so this idea that non-interventionism is um, is something that's that's lasting rather than just a temporary fad. Re- you know, the idea that Trump actually represents something deeper um, than just uh, you know the the twitchings of his own brain is. Uh, so this is, is helpful. Is, 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 this, sorry, is, this is well, to the, this is this is actually interesting because what but here's the thing, right? Post Vietnam, America is obviously going through a non-interventionist phase, and one could have very easily said, look. Post World War II moment was a flash in the pan. We had Korea. We sort of rebuilt Europe. But now, after the debacle in Vietnam, which is far worse than anything that happened in the Middle East the past twenty years, in terms of um, blood and treasure, but we came back. You then have Desert Storm. You have the interventions in Yugoslavia during the nineteen nineties and the Iraq War. Do you think this is permanent? Do I think what is permanent? The, 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 this, the, the current, the moment, the reaction to Iraq, the reaction 
to Afghanistan is what Marshall's getting at is, yeah, we had the isolationist moment, you know, forward in forward in South Vietnam, 1975. But we came back. We became a great power nation that believed very much. Well, not even the great its power. Own strength. Intervention. Intervention. An, an, an came interventionist back. nation. So is this a, what he's saying? And I think this is a great question. Is there a permanence to the current attitude? Yes, I think so. Well, yeah. I mean, to the extent yeah. nothing is permanent in life. Within but, reason, of but course. within reason, yes. No, I, I. That's that's the difference mm. between me and 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 the others that I'm talking about is that uh, is that I think there is something mm-hmm. permanent about it. And I think, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, mentioned Tucker Carlson the, or the debate at the, yeah. at the conservatives con- conference. My talk got criticized from two sides. Um, it got. So you're right. <laughs> of course, I'm right. Yeah. I'm in the I'm in the I'm in the healthy middle, you yeah. know, the same ra- <laughs> rational middle. You're a moderate. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm a moderate ra- nationalist. I'm, I'm rational. And uh, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm neither left nor right. I'm an American. Yeah. <laughs> give, give us no, the give us the, the American foreign so, policy. No, so the, yeah. the but on one side, yeah. they said I was too interventionist. This is like the the, the sort of um, uh, the from the American conservative. I mean, talking about the mm-hmm. publication from sort of that that point of view, uh, and from the Cato sort of point of view, libertarian point of view. They 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 believe that we can just cut a deal with Iran and get out of the Middle East. Um, and then on the other side, my my point was. Because the because the non-interventionism is now permanent, because we do have priorities in Asia and China is rising, uh, and so on. We don't have unlimited resources to throw in the Middle East, so we have to have others pick up the slack. That means allies. That logic leads me inevitably to, well, obviously, it, Israel is our ally in that regard, but also Turkey, and I say we should work very hard to try to patch things up with, with, with Turkey. And that that immediately gets a lot of people nervous. And I'm thinking back also to my- Also Saudi Arabia, it's also- And I'm work. thinking back to my question about the Vietnam era and the key thing here, and what's different between now and then, thanks for your articulate, because tell me to get to this. At core, the 1990s were still a unipolar world. The US didn't have a rival. Chi- um, you know, Even in the 70s and 80s, the Soviet Union was not the sort of peer competitor that China is going to be in the next 10 to 15 years. So I think that's a sort of key dynamic that has to be illustrated. Exactly. The, the and, we had this, and we had this military revolution. Uh, and uh, and uh, we had a military revolution. We had a, we had in terms a, of the revolution of military affairs with the technology yes, and those uh-huh. yes, sort of things. Yes. And, that, and so we had a moment of unbelievable military superiority. We had this incredible um, economic surge under Reagan and that continued under Clinton. And, and, and then we had the, uh, the tech revolution. Uh, and then, and the other countries started to absorb these things. So we have serious competitors out there now. Globalization yeah. worked. Global- Global- the uni- Glo- the globalization unipolarity worked. was dispersed across the global <laughs> order, basically. And now we're back in an era of great state competition. So I think to tie a bow on this entire discussion, which is how is the what is the way forward after Trump? So regardless of Democrat, Republican, the realization if you could have and hammer into the mind of a foreign policy elite. In this country, and and there can be differences on this. What should the core mindset be going forward? Uh, I I think that because of the phenomena that you just described, the the, the key actors in the world are nation states, and that's what the, that's what the national that's what I think another thing that we all shared at the Nationalism Conference, nation states, and we should be thinking about alliances with like-minded states. Um, Don't not, think of institutions. So it's so the way you should think about the world is an international institution. It's not UN, the EU. European Union. No, it's, it's about no. the states. It's about yeah. the states, and there there are certain states that are poised to deal with the competition that's coming. You can see them, and Israel is one of them, right? Israel Israel is going to be one of our best allies, if not our best ally in the world, because they have they have a they have a vibrant economy. They have a a, a, a first class. Um, uh, a, a first-class intelligence organization. They have uh, a, an absolute top-tier military, and they are willing to use their military to look after their interests on their own. We just we we just back backstop them. Again, Australia, same question. If the, so, if it's against Iran in the in the Middle East, we've got a, a, a country like Israel that we can mm-hmm. rely on. If it's a country like uh, uh, China, we have Aus- Australia, of course, Japan, South Korea as well. But uh, but but clearly, when you look at when you look across the board, Australia just jumps up as a as a, as an incredible asset. Also, the United Kingdom, I think, is going to come back after uh, after Brexit. I mean, there are, there are these are these are nation states 
that have a whole set of attributes that make them great partners for the United States. Yeah. And what's so fascinating is, and this is the way, because I think it's important that we illustrate for the audience how this discussion has changed. What you're not proposing is we need a NATO for the for for Asia Pacific. You're not saying we need to leverage the United States' weight in international institutions. You are saying at a very core level, and this is sort of the whole return of history point, you're arguing that we operate from this framework, and that's the key thing here. I, I think there has to be a kind of third way between interventionism and um, uh, and isolationism, and the the key I, I, the key issue is deterrence. We need to deter the bad actors in the world. And I would add one other thing: I'm worried. I I, I think that the non-interventionist mood is more than just a mood. I think it's going to be a, a larger trend that we have to contend with, and I think we have to we have to be careful that it not go too far. What is too far? Well, too far. I mean, we the actual key, isolationism. <laughs> well, yeah, well, we have to deter bad actors. We mm-hmm. cannot. Uh, the, the lesson that we learned. Uh, I mean, the World War II analogies. You want to take them too far, but we did learn something. Um, Eisenhower learned something from. Um, the withdrawal of the United States and the, you know, the, the, the belief that we can just let, let, let Europe take care of itself, forget about Asia, and don't worry about this alliance between Germany and, J- and, and Japan. Well, there came a moment when we realized that actually our freedom is, is dependent to a certain extent on the freedom of Europe. We have a stake in the freedom of Europe. We have a stake in the in in, in the freedom. Uh, we have a stake in in the in the uh, the independence and the power of other free countries, and we need to we need to we need to we need to build on that, and we need to have build up uh, deterrence against those 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 bad actors. Now, deterrence doesn't necessarily mean interventionism, uh, but we need to be. That's where we need to be thinking very hard. How do we deter China? How do we deter Iran? Um, and, and who are our partners in that deterrence? Well, a well-articulated case for deterrence and a third way uh, between neocon interventionism and isolation. Mike Duran, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Mike recently hosted Senator Ted Cruz at Hudson Institute, where they unpacked the ongoing debate over the interventionist versus isolationist approaches to foreign policy. Go to Hudson.org to check out the video and the transcript of that discussion. As always, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Please rate us five stars and subscribe to The Realignment wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you next week.